I don't throw darts at a board. I bet on sure things. Read Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Every battle is won before it's ever fought. Think about it. Welcome, closers, to another episode of the Profitable Property Management Podcast. Today, I have Michael Kraus from Atrium on the show. Excited to have him on. I've been on a bit of a hi- recording hiatus. We've been publishing weekly, but it's actually been about a month since I have recorded an episode. So I'm excited to have an exciting guest here as my first guest back in the saddle. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jordan. Appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Where am I talking to you from today? We are in Lake Mary, Florida, which is a suburb of Orlando, Florida. All right. So I got to ask right out of the gate here. You got some paraphernalia behind you. For those that are listening, could you describe what the, what the office setup is here? Oh, this is uh, so I am in a tiny office box. Uh, I am actually I share an office with my coworker Roger. Um, we have about seven seven by nine, so sixty three square feet that we are sharing here. Uh, the paraphernalia in the background. So this is actually one of my favorite uh, items in the office. We have a compilation video that we're making of uh, anytime we get a new owner contract, we we blow this air horn. It's a marine strength air horn. Um, and we, we tend to startle people. So uh, you might, there may have been a couple of clips of that on social media in the past, uh, but at some point there will be a compilation video of people getting the crap scared out of them by the air horn. Uh, some of the other stuff we've got, I got a signed Tom Brady football, or actually, no, not Tom Brady. We were, the staff got me a Gronkowski uh, football where we, we, I, I might share some common traits with, with, uh, with Rob Gronkowski. Um, a make property management great again hats some books i've been gifted and some whiskeys uh that i've been gifted as well um and then there's some there's some like trophies that we we do in the office and we hit 200 leases and stuff like that so just some different things i love it man well there's not something we talk to about uh, talk about a ton but the office said it matters yeah uh, there's some michigan toilet paper too if there's any ohio state buckeye fans out there Well, you you definitely got to own your space, and it looks like you were owning all sixty. Do you get all sixty <laughs> square feet, or do you get thirty two, a half? I get I get thirty one and a half. Yeah, so if, that, if that's the right amount, sixty three square feet, so thirty one and a half. Yep, that's all mine. Well, you you've made it your own, so keep standing yeah. up right in that space, man. Awesome. So I'd love to kind of dive in with some background on the company. One of the reasons that I wanted to have you on is because how many years have you been in business now? Uh, we've uh, have been basically started our company um, in January 2015. So the company was started back in uh, 2001, um, but we purchased it October 31st of 2014. We really got started January of 2015. So, love it, uh, love it. So you guys yeah. are so kind of newer in the business, but you're running a decent size company. You guys have been pretty aggressive with growth and uh, kind of represent the new school of property management, if you will. So there's going to be some great themes here that we get into, but before diving in, let's just talk background. You just managed that the company had already been around for some time. Talk me through how you, you got in. Was it an acquisition? How'd you get in? How'd you meet your business partner? All that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, met my business partner, um, actually through his wife. So uh, we were at a charity event, um, and I ran into his wife, Monica, um, and we were just networking. Basically I heard, she heard an Ohio state song that I had requested at the piano bar. Um, she said, you're going to love my husband. Uh, we went out to dinner. We became fast friends. We, we saw eye to eye on a lot of things, Ohio state football. Uh, we both liked, um, you know, kind of hanging out, having fun. So uh, he owned some investment properties um, and he would ask me questions. Sunday, we'd be hanging out watching football on the TV in his pool. Um, and he'd be asking me questions on this tenant didn't pay rent. I can't get them to, what do I do now? And I'm telling him how to send out a three day. So over time, um, he just realized that, um, you know, I was hard, I was working really hard at my job and doing a great job for a, a big property management firm out of Los Angeles. Um, but he uh, saw value in that and, and with him owning rental properties, ultimately he wanted to own a property management company. Um, so we went to work trying to find one to buy. Cool thing was he was in small business lending, so he knew how to make the finance side of the acquisition 
happen. Um, and I was in property management, so I knew how to run the company afterwards. Um, and basically, over the course of the next year or so, we looked at different businesses until we found Atrium. Um, Atrium technically wasn't on the market. Um, Adam had a relationship with the business broker who found the deal at the time, and he had been reached out to by the previous owner of Atrium. Um, and the previous owner said, hey, I want to get my business ready to sell in the next five years, can you help me get everything cleaned up so we can do that? I said, well, I have somebody who's looking right now and you might be willing to buy it from me today. Um, the rest is history. So on October 31st, 2014, uh, we closed on the company. Um, and January 15th, 2015, I moved back from Boston and, and we hit the ground running um, and, and started uh, started running Atrium at that point. So um, that's kind of how we, how we got our start. Um, we started out with about 220 doors. Um, and today we've grown to right around 1400 doors, um, since that time. Let's talk about so, the type of doors. Give me a unit type breakout. Multifamily. Is it all single? Yeah. Um, we have about 500 multifamily. Um, this, there's a couple of different, um, you know, types of multifamily. Um, we call it, we like to call it boutique multifamily. Um, those are the, the complexes that are generally speaking, you know, 60, 50 to 60 units and under, um, that, that makes up uh, about 250 of those doors. Um, and then we have about another 250 that actually have onsite management. Um, and the fee structure is a little different, so we look at it differently. When they have onsite management, that's kind of just true multifamily uh, property management. So um, about 500 doors there and about 900 single family doors. Got it. Any, any short term or is it all long term? All long term, no short term. Even though we're in Central Florida, um, you know, eventually maybe, but uh, it's just a totally different beast. And if anybody's read the book, Good to Great, we have been trying to take a hedgehog approach and just stay focused on, on what we want to do right now. Focus. Yeah. The only F word we use on this show. I love it. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more. So no cussing. This is a, <laughs> I should ask that ahead of time. For those of you out there that know me, I sh should have clarified. I'm, thank you for, for sneaking that in there. <laughs> Let's talk more about, well, knowing you. No, I'm just joking. Let, yeah. Let's talk more about <laughs> how we actually get to this outcome because my sense is, that you have not had us, you have not been one of these guys that has dumped a ton of money into sales and marketing. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of this came from organic growth. And I want to hear more about how you go from 200 some on units to 1400 in that period of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. We haven't actually spent any dollars on traditional like pay-per-click advertising or anything like that. Um, you know, I would say most of it, almost all of it has just been word of mouth and relationship based. Um, you know, we get a good portion of our um, new customers through realtors. Um, so I joined a BNI and i group in 2015. Um, you know, I think on reoccurring revenue, um, you know, we're up to like 30,000, $40,000 a year. Um, and, in revenue from referrals from that BNI group. Um, so that's been good, um, just kind of getting out there and networking in that, and within that sphere of influence. If you haven't heard of BNI, there's a ton of information out there. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, you know, Jim Roman, um, who's kind of, kind of a, a, an educator within the NARPM uh, mm -hmm. sphere here. Um, he talks about it all the time and uses it for a lot of his trainings. It's been super helpful for me. Um, that being said, outside of realtors, We've gotten a lot um, from brokers, um, specifically, you know, multifamily brokers. There aren't a lot of people out there that do boutique property manage boutique multifamily property management well, um, you know, and that's one of the things we've kind of carved out a little niche for ourselves in Orlando um, that we're one of the go-to people, one of the go-to companies for that smaller multifamily property, you know, kind of 50 units and under. Um, gotten to know some of the brokers and received quite a good deal of business. Um, from from that um, and then outside of that uh, just just networking and being out there um, you know building your brand personally um, you know Adam had a great network kind of in the commercial real estate um, you know uh, industry here in Orlando that's led to quite a bit of um, business uh, just because he was in commercial real estate beforehand we've kept those connections alive we go to commercial real estate events even though we don't necessarily do commercial real estate um, it keeps us in touch and in the forefront of their minds as, uh, you know, as they come across referrals. Um, and that's, that's, that's it primarily. I mean, relationships, I can go into depth on any one of those sources. If you're interested, if any of them like pique your interest, I'd be happy to talk further about those, um, you know, relationships with realtors, relationships with commercial or multifamily brokers, 
have been huge for us. And, let's talk uh, about let's talk about BNI. Let's let's start there. So a lot of folks hear about BNI, and there's some level of skepticism. I'm gonna I'm gonna show up. It's probably gonna be a little boring. Um, you know, do I have to, do I have to put myself out there knowing you and Adam, you guys are somewhat outgoing. What are the caveats or the conditions for BNI working in terms of your temperament, your personality, your market, the size of the group, who's in the group? Give me, give me the parameters for when it does versus when it does not work. That's a great idea. That's a, that's a great question. Um, so, and just to kind of, you know, you said, you said that I'm, kind of outgoing or kind of, um, yeah, that's actually, that's actually a pretty good description. I am not naturally somebody who loves to go out and network. Um, you know, it's not a comfortable thing for me. Um, I walk into a room and I'm definitely one of those people that's like picking and choosing who I'm going to go talk to. It's not like, I'm not the butterfly who talks to every single person in the room until I get comfortable in that environment. Sure. Um, the, the nice thing about B and I is you're networking with the same people every single week. Um, and so you, you start to build relationships and those referrals will build over time. Um, you know, there are rules to BNI that some people don't like. A lot of people in BNI are either salespeople or business owners. Um, and, and people don't like having accountability. Um, but for me, it's great because it means every single person, I know every single person in the room is putting work in to, get, to give and get referrals. Um, there's nobody in the room that's just coasting. If you're coasting in BNI and you're not doing the work, you get kicked out. Um, you know, there's basically some, you know, some, it teaches you to do networking correctly um, from the standpoint of you have, um, you have to do in-person meetings. You have to meet with, um, you know, fellow members of your group once a week or, you know, on average once a week. Um, you know, you have to show up to the meeting. Um, if you've ever been a member of, you know, your local chamber of commerce or any host of other networking meetings, when you go, a lot of times you see different faces and it doesn't lend itself to long-term relationships and meaningful connections. Um, and, and that's how you make long, that's how you get long-term business. You know, you don't want to make a connection that you get one, one referral from that realtor. You'd rather over the course of the next 10 years, make a solid relationship and get every single referral that that realtor, um, you know, um, sends out. So, and to make BNI successful, the key for a, uh, for a property manager is that a, your group has a good vibe, but B your realtor is a productive member of the real estate community. Um, you know, if your realtor sells two or three deals a year and they're just there each week to get, you know, the two or three deals they're going to sell from their BNI group, you're not in a good group, unfortunately for referrals for you, because they're going to probably be your number one source. Um, you know, Basically, you want a realtor that's got a great attitude, got a great reputation in the community. So if you're getting asked to join a BNI group, that's the first person you should look to. Um, another person that is good for referrals is your uh, insurance broker or your, um, or your mortgage broker. Both of those deal with a lot of people in real estate. And so they have referrals. Um, you know, I ended up getting a client that has 24 houses that he rents out from our uh, mortgage broker. That's a pretty good refer referral. Nice. Um, you know, yeah, accountants are good. If you got an accountant that's very active, he's looking at everybody's tax returns. You know, he can say, hey, have you thought about property management? Somebody's getting re ready to retire. They're going to use a property manager. It's perfect. Um, you know, the other, the other, um, the other person in the group that I actually get a lot of uh, referrals from is our mover. Believe it or not, we have a moving company and that guy all the time, hey, we can't sell our house. He's just having conversations in the living room with these people about moving their furniture and you know, push comes to shove and they, they say, we haven't decided what we're gonna do yet with the house. We just got this job offer. You know, We're trying to get the move figured out. Um, he's been a great referral source for me also. Um, so that, there's a, you know, I would say, Mover, um, insurance and, and mortgage broker and real estate agent are probably going to be 90% of your leads. If you're joining a BNI group that doesn't have those, think twice. Look for another one. Um, if you go in and you don't like the realtor, you don't click with the realtor, it's probably not going to be a good fit or very productive for you. Um, and then ultimately, you just get out, get out of it what you put into it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm nearing giving our BNI, BNI group uh, close to a million dollars um, and closed business in the last three years. Um, meaning I've sent people in our group $900,000 worth of business. So they want to be the one that gets me a referral. 
You know what I mean? And that's not really bragging. It's just, honestly, it's the team that's been sending out these referrals. I don't even, half the time, I don't even know they're going out. Nice. Um, you know, so, but at the same time, now they want to get us business because they want to get a piece of that pie. So that's, that's it. B and I can be super helpful on a personal level. It's, it's helped me get more comfortable in my own skin networking. It's taught me the principles of follow up, follow through building relationships. Um, you know, it's honestly helped even, even with my public speaking. If you saw my talk in, um, 2016 at broker owner, uh, or 2017 at Broker Owner, I was, I was pretty nervous. I don't like it. I've gotten a lot more comfortable talking in front of crowds just because B&I every single week. Um, I, I was the president of my organization and I'm the educational leader. So it's a great way to get, you know, get experience in that business setting. What does the time commitment look like? Meetings once a week. Um, generally speaking, it's about two hours. Um, you know, our meeting starts, open networking starts at seven, uh, ends at 8.45. The whole meeting is at 8:45. Um, it, the good thing is they do it in the morning, you know, so you can knock it out. Sometimes it's at lunch. Um, that's the time commitment in terms of the meeting. You are expected to do a one-to-one -one per week, which is like a lunch meeting, um, you know, where you could have somebody sit down in your office across the desk from you um, and just talk about what's the best way to, to send referrals um, between you and that other person. Um, so two out, probably three hours a week on average. Um, in a leadership role, it might be a little bit more, um, you know, maybe four. I, I would highly recommend getting involved in a leadership role just because you get out of it what you put in. Um, and it's been, it's been great for me. What kind of churn has your group had? Have folks, have, have any non-performers been pushed out since you've been in it? Yeah, absolutely. So we started out, I mean, they have a traffic light system, which without getting into too much depth, it's basically a ranking. Um, and there's red, yellow, red. Or I'm sorry, there's green, yellow, red, and gray. If you're in the green or gray, or the red or gray, you're out. Like basically, you're on your way out. You've either got to get your score up or you're going to be asked to leave um, or non renewed. Um, so, our group right now has nobody in the red and nobody in the gray. So, everybody's in the green or yellow, meaning they're doing everything that they should be doing. Um, and so, uh, our churn rate, if I had to take a guess, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly, um, I'd say our churn rate is probably about 25% across the board in BNI. Um, the, the standard is you're gonna lose about a member a month, so 12 members a year. Um, we have 50 members in my group right now, which is fairly large. Um, I think the average group is probably like 27, 28, something like that. Uh, Jim could probably definitely tell you, Jim Roman. <laughs> I don't yeah. know those stats exactly. Um, but if that were the case, you know, if, if it is 27 or 28 and you're expecting 12 a year, I mean, that's close to like a 50% churn. Um, we have a good solid group with people that have been in it for 12, 15 years, some of them. Um, and a lot of those people just don't leave. Um, so we have, I would say we probably have a lower than average churn rate um, of maybe like, you know, 20% or so. And what's the geographic parameters? How, how big does the territory cover? That's a good question. There's no specific parameter. You would want to join one in your area because those same people have joined people, you know, have joined that group in your area. Cool. Does that make sense? Like, you know, you've got a, a plumber and you're in, you know, you're in downtown, you know, Orlando. You're going to want a plumber that wants to plug into a meeting in downtown Orlando, not in you know Kissimmee that's an hour away or 45 minutes away. They would have joined a group that's in Kissimmee if that's where their business is. Totally makes sense. I love that you've leveraged this strategy. This is probably a shot in the arm for some folks that have dabbled with it. And I love that you're taking it full circle and communicating that you've really reciprocated in a significant way. You haven't been a, a consumer. You've, you've been engaged and that's a ton of business to have referred out. Realtor relationships are probably the number one place that people's head goes to when they think about growth, when they think about referrals. Right out of the gate, I'd love to just start talking about, but we're talking about the commerce side of it. We had Michael Mayer speak at PM Grow talking about referrals. Kind of his whole shtick was in large part that it's not about the money, it's not about the finance, it's about the relationship, the service quality, the continuity of knowing that if I send you a trusted client, they will be taken care of. What is your view on that? I think BNI is probably a good co corollary. Do you incentivize realtor referrals and what's your take on that in general? So we do. Um, and when he, when he gave that talk, it definitely gave me pause that, Hey, I might be just throwing money away. <laughs> so we haven't made any changes 
Um, you know, but uh, that's not to say it's not the right move. Um, you know, it very well could be. Um, I had a meeting today, actually, coincidentally, um, right at two o'clock this afternoon, just a couple hours ago. Um, and the realtor specifically said to me, you know, for 10 years, I had given business to your company um, with previous ownership, um, and I never received a referral fee. He's like, I've never expected a referral fee. We pay referral fees to him now, and um, you know, we actually probably pay quite a bit more than the industry standard. Um, but he said, it's not why I give you business. The reason I give you business is because you handle the client. You handle my clients with care. You've shown that you care about them. You take, you answer their calls. You answer their questions. Um, and so that that's why I send people to you. Um, you know, so that that lends a lot of credibility to uh, what he had said in his talk. Um, that being said, it hasn't been enough for us to change our ways yet. We still, we still give away referral fees um, to realtors. And, and what we, one of the things that we do to take it to another level is a lot of times we'll actually take the check over to the, the broker or the realtor in person to show up in their office. Mm. Um, and that's, that's had a pretty good effect. Yeah, it's had a good effect not only with that realtor, but you also get to see the other realtors in the office. You know, if somebody asks, what are you doing? Oh, I'm dropping off a referral check. They, you know, send us a property management agreement. Um, you know, I heard of somebody doing it, and Adam thinks it's a great, somebody dropped, used to drop off payday bars with their thing. That's a little bit cheesy for me. Um, but we have, we definitely have sent, you know, gifts to the realtors that send us referrals. Um, just recently, we bought a very nice gift to a, for a realtor. We we sent him a seven hundred and fifty dollars suit um, because oh. we thought it would be yeah. And but those things, I th you know, I talked about that in our um, in my talk at um, at the broker owner a couple of years ago. Um, you know, those things, those gifts can pay huge dividends. Um, one of the brokers has given us over two hundred doors. Um, you know, how, like, how can, how can you pay that back? What would you be willing to spend on Google ads? Um, you know, wow. to, to be able to do that. Yeah. So you can't out gift that kind of stuff. Um, Andrew Smallwood from, uh, filter easy recommended a book. If you're thinking about gifting, there's a book Giftology, called Giftology. Baby. Yeah. yeah. By John Rulin. By John Rulin. It was amazing. Yeah. You can't, I mean, you can't, like he has some great stories in there that are just mind blowing and you, you, you won't get all of them right. He says that you can't hit a home run every time, but when you do, it'll just pay dividends that, that are off the charts. You can't buy that kind of advertising. I love it. 200 units from one broker. I mean, that's, that's jaw dropping that kind of impact. Like, so you mentioned with BNI that you have to ha have people that are doing velocity in the realtor chair, in the, the mortgage officer chair, et cetera. In terms of finding a realtor that can send that kind of a volume, I can't imagine there's a lot of folks in any given market that have that kind of referral capacity. And these folks, these folks are sought after. Were you finding that you were displacing existing referral relationships that like, what were these folks doing before they had a relationship with you? The broker. So um, the, the one specifically that's given us a lot of doors, his, his broker is a property manager. Um, so he shouldn't be able to give us referrals. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, we've developed a relationship and we've become the backup. Right. And that's resulted in, um, you know, a, a very good uh, referral source for us. Um, so you don't necessarily need to be the number one. But a lot of times people say, hey, I want a couple of referrals. How many times if, as a property manager has some, so can you send me some uh, realtors? I want to interview a few of them. You know, how many times have you been interviewed by a potential property owner that is also looking at seven other companies? You know what I mean? Like, it happens all the time. So um, seek those brokers out. Um, specifically for us, it's been in that boutique multifamily, you know, um, market where it's just people, uh, just just uh, properties that don't have on-site management. Um, you know, and then cultivate those relationships. Go play golf. Take them out to lunch. Buy their lunch. You know, whatever you can do um, mm -hmm. to try and build those relationships. Um, that's that's what we've done. Same thing goes with you know, like the realtors that we work with. Um, in terms of just residential realtors, um, they might, they don't do the volume to, to pass you 200 referrals, but they can pass you 10 a year. If you have 10 of those relationships, that's a hundred doors, you know, and we, we have at least 10 of those realtor relationships with people that, you know, are doing 5 million, 10 million in sales each year. Um, you know, and, and we'll go to dinner with them. We'll take them out to lunch. We'll buy them breakfast. We'll show up at the office with, 
We just recently found that the cupcake place right next door, they'll put an atrium logo on top of a cupcake for you. So we drop them, but we dropped it off at seven offices last week <clears throat> to just keep our name in their face. Hey guys, this is Jordan, your show host, and also one of the founders of the Tribe Mastermind. I just wanted to give you guys a little shout out to let you know that we got something special going on with Tribe Mastermind. This is a high level mastermind for property management entrepreneurs that are interested in talking about the big picture. Yes, most certainly business, the tactical, the strategic, but also the big why behind why we're on this journey together. So if you're interested in learning more about Tribe, what this mastermind looks like, you can get more details at tribemastermind.com. Check it out. I'd love to see you there. Now, do you have brokerage and what's your take on this whole notion that a lot of folks really glom on to, which is the idea that I won't have a brokerage so that I can get a lot of realtor referrals? What's your take on that? We don't do any sales at Atrium. So we, we've we kept that same mindset at this point. Um, we probably are leaving money on the table and, and, you know, in terms of real estate sales. That being said, um, you know, those realtor referrals and those relationships are important. Um, <clears throat> So we kind of subscribe to that mindset, whether it's right or wrong, that's the way we've always done business. So um, we'll, we'll keep doing that for the time being at least. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's easier to criticize money being left on the table for companies that are struggling to grow. The kind of growth velocity that you've had, you would kind of be the poster child for actually arguing in favor of that. This is the rare scenario that I think really makes a compelling argument here. In terms of how you have it structured though, is there any language or understanding around returning deals back at the point that a property, that, that a listing goes on the market? Yeah, we always, we do, we do ensure the realtors, um, you know, and we'll go to real estate offices. We, I did one at the local Keller, I did a little presentation at the local Keller Williams office recently. Um, where I brought in lunch, did a quick PowerPoint presentation. And one of the things we highlight is we don't do sales and we send your clients back. So we notated in that folio who that referral came from so that when that person, you know, when that tenant puts a notice and the owner says, Hey, I want to sell, we have instantly, you know, try to send it back to that, uh, to that realtor. Uh, it works most of the time. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, a lot of times we get the um, referral because the realtor didn't have, wasn't able to sell the property at the price that the owner wanted. Um, so that relationship sometimes is tainted. And we have had owners that said, I'm not going back to them, they couldn't sell my property. At that point, you, you just try to go back to the owner and say, you know, I'm really sorry I tried, but you know, he decided to go with this person. You know, sometimes they're, you know, they, hey, it's not your fault. As long as you're open and honest with the communication, um, you know, there's nothing you can do, it's out of your control. Sure. Yeah. M makes sense. So that's really helpful on the growth side. The corollary issue is always how you handle growth internally with operations. My fundamental belief about life is that you get what you're looking for. If you're looking for growth, it'll show up. If you're looking for uh, peace and quiet and not breaking things, that will show up too, but growth probably won't. Growth by nature breaks things. The guy that wants to grow is a full-time firefighter and a part-time arsonist, right? Like you, you grow, you get things working, and then you break it again because you dumped on a couple hundred more units. How do you guys manage the, the internal conversation around when is the right time to keep pushing strain on the system? And how do you talk to your staff around what the incentive should be for them to continue to grow? That's a great question. That is a loaded question. I should be taking notes. There's like seven points in there. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so for us, it's always been grow or die. Like, you know, there's never, especially, you know, my business partner, Adam, um, you know, when I, when we first got Atrium rolling, you know, when we were at 220 doors, I remember thinking like, we can't, we can't handle this. Like, why are we keep getting, why do we keep getting more leads and we keep taking them? Like, we can't even handle the ones we have. But Adam was just like, no, just keep going. Somewhere along the line, I realized, oh, this is how we do business. You know, we <laughs> need to keep, this is where we need to keep growing. You know, he, he always had that entrepreneurial mindset and it's been a more learned thing for me. Um, whereas now I'm definitely, you know, grow or die. Um, so we've been blessed and kind of um, uh, had had uh, had the benefit of some great relationships that we formed through NARPM um, with some people who are further down the line. So I think we've kind of skipped um, some mistakes or some growing pains uh, through the relationships within NARPM. Um, at the end of 2017, 
um, I went up to visit Duke Dotson and uh, his team up in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and he taught me a couple of things. Um, you know, they taught me a couple of things that completely revolutionized our business. Um, so we saw them doing, we were departmental at the time. We had about nine employees and everybody was responsible for their own tasks. You know, one person was responsible for all the renewals. One person was responsible for all the payables. One person was responsible for doing all the showings. Um, and so when an owner called the office, they had nine points of contact that they were trying to figure out who was the right one to talk to. Um, and I personally had somewhere in the neighborhood 400 you know, um, the owner relationships that I was trying to juggle with the, and I just didn't have the ability to keep it up anymore. Um, Tim and Duke over at Dodson uh, taught us about, you know, structuring our teams and what they called pods. And we've adopted that same um, thought process to be able to have a team of three, um, which is kind of the makeup of most of the smaller property management companies that run really well and really profitable, small teams of, you know, two to four um, that run, you know, two, three, 400 units. Um, so we saw that, broke our team up in that in May of 2007, uh, 2018, um, and it's been amazing. Um, we also learned about traction, which we implemented that same time, May of 2018, June of 2018. Really rolled it out um, at the end of 2018 and uh, been rocking and rolling with it all throughout 2019. So that's been huge for us. Um, it, it was huge at PM Grow. You know, we heard all about traction. Andy Moore gave a great talk about traction. Um, cool thing is, we went and visited Andy Moore last January, and I have the notes written down. Um, one of the things I wrote on the page that we want to implement in 2018 was traction. It's like bullet point number two. Um, you know, and we're going down to Andy Moore to see how he runs his team. Um, because he's very professional, very honest stuff, as you know, as you had him speak at your conference. Absolutely. Um, so those relationships within NARPM that, that people who have already done what we wanted to do, do to, you know, 4,500 doors, you know, um, Andy's business runs like a well-oiled machine. It's super professional. If you ever get down there to check it out. Um, you know, those, these were people we wanted to emulate people we just chose to to learn from seek out an expert in your field and just go you know steal their stuff if they're willing to share um Got it. thankfully these guys were that's so. great so, so we're getting specific and breaking some things down what is the capacity for a uh, a pod or a squad pod team of three for us um we think with you know our biggest pod right now has 450 doors um it's a lot of um boutique multifamily in there so um, it, you could you could argue that that's easier than individual. Multi, it, it, you don't even really need to argue it. A group of fifteen apartments in a small apartment community is easier to manage than fifteen individual houses scattered throughout a you know a, a twenty mile radius, right? So it is easier to manage. But um, you know I would say max capacity is probably like three fifty. Um, we haven't pushed it um, in terms of max capacity. We are. Um, in the process of pushing it and trying to get those up. So, um, but yeah, we have one that's at 450. So some of the benefits here, part of what you're mentioning via the story from Duke is the customer experience. There's one point of contact. Let's talk about some of the other dimensions on that though. People get sick, presumably there's more resilience, somebody quits, et cetera. Give me, give me the 411 on some other benefits that you see from adopting this structure. To lots of benefits. One of the things that, you know, one of the things that was immediately um, apparent was we were going to be able to add some type of, type of like progression for our employees to see, right? We added a layer of management, um, which was a huge benefit to Adam and myself because we no longer became the point of contact for those owners. Um, and it's allowed us to kind of step away and work on our business a lot more. Um, you know, the whole traction process, we never could have done that before with the way we were structured because we were, we were just spending so much time, you know, being a firefighter and putting out those fires personally, we didn't have the time to work on the business. So that's been huge for us. Um, you know, it's also given our new entry level position employees, um, which are a leasing agent and a maintenance person, a path forward. They can see, you know, if I get to that senior property manager or asset manager level, um, you know, I'm going to a make more money, have more responsibility, eventually maybe run a market. Um, you know, and so those are, it's, it's been a benefit, um, from an employee perspective as well. Um, and it just, it, to me, like one of the cool things about our industry is you learn so much about so many different things. You know, we've got, you know, 21 year old kids coming out of UCF 
that have never owned a house, but they know all about how to repair their house. You know what I mean? You've got kids that are you know, involved in real estate transactions and now they know how lending works. They know how financing works on properties. They know how to read a cash flow statement that you don't usually get until you're a business owner. Um, you know, so, uh, there's a lot of cool experiences that you get, um, on those lower levels. Whereas before, when we were departmental, you just stayed in your lane and you didn't learn anything outside of your lane. This you're required to learn so many different positions. So to your point, somebody goes on vacation, you can step right in and say, Oh, I know how to look this up. You know, yeah, my senior PM's on vacation, but you know, let me answer that for you. I'll look at your statement and tell you what it is. Um, that's the other thing we kind of did was we took away a lot of the fear in dealing with the owners and just gave the, you know, the, the property owners, the landlords and kind of gave it to the people. It's had its ups and its downs, but overall it's a lot better for that owner to be able to call and get a hold of somebody as opposed to having to wait until this person's done showing or gets out of a listing appointment or whatever. Um, so there's been a lot of benefits. Um, you know, and, and it just, it feels more like a team. It's a great environment. Our employees don't necessarily dread coming to work. I think most of them like coming to work. Um, we've been uh, ranked, uh, we were fourth last year. I don't know where we end up but, uh, this year, but we're, again, best places to work with the Orlando Business Journal. Um, you know, so. Of all, uh, of all, in all verticals or within property management? Orlando Business Journal, all verticals, uh, micro companies, they call us, which is kind of an offensive name, but it's 25 <laughs> and under. Micro. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. That's, that's, hey, that's awesome, man. That's saying something. That's really exciting. Happier people, happier clients. I love that. So just, just one point too, and I meant to mention this before, um, the Orlando Business Journal has been an amazing partner for us. Um, so if you have a local business journal in your city, they can be a huge tool for you. Go to their networking events, meet the people on their team. They deal with hundreds of businesses, right? And they have, they have the connections in the top levels of those businesses. Get in those doors, especially the ones that relate to you. Every year we sponsor the Residential Real Estate Awards for the Orlando Business Journal. Um, and we have a booth there and we talk to 150, 200 realtors at that event who, mm -hmm. oh God, I hate property management. Yeah, here, let me have your card. You know, so there's so many different resources within your local business journal. I highly recommend that partnership. It's been huge, huge for us. Love that. Sorry. Great tip. Speaking of partnerships, yeah. let's talk a little bit about your partnership with Adam. Partnerships are a topic of great interest for me because in my personal career, collaboration has been the nexus of great things. It's also been the nexus of hours and hours of bitching on my behalf and you get the best and you get the worst of it but in the end collaboration the who is where the magic happens and your experience with adam how do you divvy up labor what were the uh, divvy up responsibilities that is what were the different understandings uh, and things you had to work through over time in order to keep this a rich and happy relationship that's a great question um I keep saying that I'm not just kissing your butt. Actually, these are good questions. So kudos to you, man. Um, and it, anyway, so Adam, uh, Adam and I's relationship, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. So one of the cool things about us is we just never really argue. Um, you know, we have disagreements. Like we disagree, we disagreed on something yesterday. I'm just, I told him straight up, like I just don't agree with you. We're not going to agree on this one. Um, you know, but at the same time, we don't fight, we don't bicker. Um, so it's a good relationship. Um, there's a good balance. Um, if you're familiar with traction, um, you know, Adam is definitely the visionary mm -hmm. in our relationship. He's the big, you know, every day there's like new ideas and, and big ideas and like we're going to the moon and, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and me, I'm, I'm more of the realistic, like, okay, well, the, we don't have a vehicle to get to the moon, so we're not going to go to the moon, but what can we do to, you know, to try and get there? So I'm much more the implementer, um, you know, uh, so, uh, I, I focus more on the operations side of the business. Um, you know, early on, Adam did almost almost all of our listing appointments for the first year. I'd come on a lot of them with him. We tag team because we were so small and had the ability to do that. Um, but over time, um, you know, he moved more into that BDM role. We now have a full time BDM or BDO as we call it. Um, and um, so neither one of us do listing appointments anymore. Um, but at the time, he always had that driving the business forward. And I was always the one behind the scenes trying to figure out how to make it all run. Um, makes sense because I've been in property management since 2003 and he had been in banking and finance and commercial real estate up until, you know, he bought Atrium with me. So, um, you know, it's just been a good balance and good partnership there. 
Um, you know, uh, so I, I have I have nothing negative to say about it, but I can, I've heard the horror stories. You yeah. know, um, a lot of people that that partnerships don't go well. I mean, I would say one of the biggest keys is we just we both believe in always doing the right thing. So like when we lose money because we we give an owner you know a thousand dollars because they have an insurance deductible that they technically could have been their tenant's fault, but we just want to like make the problem go away. Um, you know, both of us will make that decision. You just do the right thing, and and, and that's one of your foundations for success. Um, I think neither one of you are ever mad at the other for you know spending money or or something like that. So um, you know, we have that philosophy in our business. It's uh, somebody said it great the other day. I read it. Um, it was, uh, you have you can either be right or you can move past the the problem. Mm. You solve Ooh. the problem. Oh, well yeah. said, man. I like that. Getting off yeah. of right is huge. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so tough. Like so many times, you are right in property management, do you, but do you really want to spend the next month fighting it in court, or um, you know, it's just it's just not worth it. So, so the, the EOS structure of implementer versus visionary, when you read that, was that an aha moment? Did you already kind of know and intuit that? When I read that, the, the distinction between a visionary, specifically what the book Traction says, is something along the lines of, if you're a visionary, be free. If you're an integrator, be stressed. <laughs> How did you relate? To, what, what opened up for you when you guys read, read that distinction? So I think, you know, but in, in reality, you know, I am kind of like, a, I'm, I would, in a different partnership, I might actually be a visionary. So, you know, I've kind of fit more into that role because I know the operations of a property manager. So I don't think it was as much of an aha. It was almost like, oh my gosh, I've got to be the integrator. Because <laughs> I was definitely a visionary. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, and it's, it's been good. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if there was necessarily an aha, but hey, this is amazing. Uh, but I can see that 100%. Like, it makes sense. And I feel like it liberates people. And I've heard other mm. people talk about it, that it's like, oh, I'm a visionary. I get to be a visionary. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, in a, I'm in a mastermind group with a couple of guys. <clears throat> and uh, some of you, I'm sure a lot of you know him. His name, one of the guys' his name is Cliff McHugh. He's out of mm. Chicago. And Jeez. Cliff is Cliff is very, very much a, uh, an integrator. And, you know, his worst nightmare is probably being locked in a room full of visionaries. Uh, and Matthew Whitaker and I and Cliff were talking about this in a car ride not too long ago. And, and Matthew's like, it would be his worst nightmare. Can you imagine his head would explode? Just like, get me out of there. Meanwhile, me, Matthew and Duke and everybody are just like, you know, talk and talk and talk. So if you, if you can't tell, I like to talk. <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. All right. Bit of, bit of flex capacity. So I had yeah. a, a meeting with a EOS implementer the other day. This was not Andy Moore. We were just sitting down talking shop and it was interesting to see him point out that there are plenty of businesses that don't have a visionary. I believe the distinction that he said is about half of businesses don't wow. have a visionary. Um, being a visionary, you know, it feels like a, it feels like a very necessary role, but don't want to stigmatize a company where there's a sole founder, sole proprietor that, that is more the integrator and doesn't necessarily have that temperament or that bent. Appreciate you commenting on partnerships. It sounds like maybe there was less to work through because you got it right. And to some degree, that sounds like there was just some luck involved there. Um, that's really exciting. That said, Cadence and communication is essential, even if things are going well. How do you schedule one-on-one -on -one communication with Adam? Is it formally structured or is it informal? Like it's ongoing pretty, meetings to just to stay in touch. Yeah, it's pretty informal for us. I mean, we we probably talk, I don't know, 10 to 15 times a day. His office is uh, 10 feet away from mine. Um, and, and our office is like a thousand square feet here where we are. So it's, you know, it's not, when we're here, we communicate very easily. Um, I would just say regular phone calls, regular uh, touching base, you know, emails. Uh, we definitely use email a lot. We don't use Slack enough. Um, you know, we've recently started using Slack as a team, um, and that would be very helpful if we get better, uh, better, uh, you know, get use that better just because of the, the historical information on there and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I, I'd say – Communication is key. Just regularly communicate. Keep in touch. Stay on the same page. You know, uh, talk about decisions that you make. Um, that those are those would be the biggest things for me. Uh, but we don't do a whole lot of formal aside from our weekly formal meetings. Like we have our level ten meeting um, with our leadership um, every single Tuesday morning. 
We then run through ops with our different pods right after that meeting. Um, and then we have our whole, we have our all hands meeting every single Friday. Um, so there's, there's, there's multiple meetings that we have on the schedule, but us together individually, um, you know, we have a financial meeting every week that we meet with our accounting department. And then outside of that, um, you know, we just communicate regularly. So got it. And traction helps you set that stuff up in terms of having those, you know, set scheduled meetings, um, the quarterly meetings, um, you know, for, you know, setting goals and, and the yearly meetings for state of the company. So, um, that's, that's huge. Uh, you know, to me, that's, that's absolutely awesome. And we didn't just, just so you know, we didn't use an implementer. Um, we did have experience from other people and we've, you know, called Matthew Whitaker at GK houses a hundred times. We called Tim and Duke over at uh, Dodson a hundred times. Um, thankfully through NARPA, we've had good connections where we've, we've kind of been able to be successful with it without um, needing an integrator at this point. I'm sure they could come in and probably do some ninja work that would really take us to the next level, but we haven't, we haven't taken that leap yet. Got it. Okay. My main takeaway from that dialogue was that you work out of a thousand square feet. So you, have <laughs> people, you work out of a thousand square feet, you get 31 and a half. Does Adam also get 31? Does the visionary get like 40 feet, 40 square feet? So, so technically we have a thousand up front. So we have two offices right now. The front <laughs> office is 985 square feet or like something like that. We have um, eight employees here. Um, and the rest are in the back office. Got it. Okay. So there's there's 12 desks in the back office. It's like a bullpen. It's just an open box with 12 yeah. desks in the conference table. Um, uh, right now, our intern sits at the conference table, and then uh, and then we have on-site employees for maintenance for multifam. So that that rounds out the rest of the employee count. Nice. Got it. That that explains things. So let's round out the interview talking about education and personal development. One thing that I know about you is that you are able and do appreciate insights and wisdom that is not property management specific. And I'm the same way, man. Property management specific stuff is great. It's useful talking about the minutia, but talking about service animals doesn't turn me on, doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. For me, the ultimate virtue or aspiration is to take big picture ideas and to apply them in a industry specific context because that's where how the level at which they have to be in order to create value. Where do you find inspiration? Who do you learn from? What have you read recently? I think the great questions, man. Uh, right now I'm reading Tools of the Titans by Tim Ferriss. Um, so Adam and I are currently going through a challenge. It's five for 55. We just kind of made it up. Um, but we're doing five things each day for 55 days in a row. And one of those five things is to read a, a chapter from Tools of the Titans. Um, so are you familiar with the book? I am. I haven't okay. read it, but so, I'm familiar. Okay. It's really good. The nice thing is, like, if you're not a reader, which I'm not, not a reader, I listen a lot. I, I listen to books on audiobook from – I just use iTunes. Um, but this book specifically, it breaks it up into small chunks. So he interviewed 250 of the world's most uh, influential people, whether it be health, wealth, or wisdom. Um, he put those people into different categories and broke it up to three sections. And each one of those interviews uh, takes his interaction with like Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, and breaks his down, his best information from an hour or two long conversation on a podcast and puts it into two to five pages, right? So I don't have to listen to, you know, thousands of hours or read a book by Arnold Schwarzenegger. I get his like cliff notes in two to five pages and it's super cool. It's been great for us. Um, you know, the, the five for 55, another part of that, like we do, we've been working out every day. We've been sending a positive message to a friend, family member, coworker every day, following a healthy diet six days a week with one cheat day. Um, no alcohol for the first 30 days, which has been tough. Um, and then, you know, reading a chapter from the, the Tools of the Titans. And then the last thing is just documenting. Um, so you get to nine o'clock at night, you're ready to answer some emails. You check your spreadsheet and you're like, oh crap, I haven't documented yet. I haven't sent that that one text to a friend, family member, or coworker, um, and you fire that off. You haven't read that chapter in Tools of the Titans. You're documenting at the end of the night. You've done everything else. You're like, ah, I got to do it. So it's been actually really fun for us, this 5 for 55 challenge. If you want more information on that, feel free to contact me. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's one. Um, recently, I've been kind of into development books. 
Um, Scott Stolwerk from Filter Easy. If you ever get a chance to meet him, I haven't seen him at conferences recently, but he was last year and the year before quite a bit. He's an amazing guy. He's a sales leader. He told me to, uh, to, to uh, always work on you. Um, you know, if you work on you first, the rest of it just works itself out. If you're focused on making positive changes in you, your interactions with other people will go well. Your interactions with owners will go well. Um, you know, and, and for me, it's been a huge, you know, it's been a huge thing. I've probably read, I don't know, 12, 13 books this year on audio. Um, just, you know, while I run at night or while I run on the weekend or, um, you know, while I'm driving to and from appointments. Um, so, um, you know, all kinds of books recently. I, I love the, I don't know if you read it. It's not really a business book, um, but living with a seal was awesome. Jesse Itzler's book. Do you, David Goggins. Yeah. with well, David Goggins is the seal. And then David Goggins, book, um, can't hurt me. Whoa. Can't hurt me. Both so, of those were so amazing. Uh, Jesse is just like, he, that dude is a visionary. I mean, some of the stories in his book, living with the seal will literally have you in tears laughing. Uh, but at the same time, he teaches you to just get rid of excuses. Just stop making excuses in your business life. You know, like the way he got his record deal is one of the funniest stories I've ever heard in my life. Uh, you know, he snuck his way into a, uh, a, a meeting with a record deal executive, right? By telling him the guy, he was like, I'm with, you know, this real recording artist. He's like, he's stuck in traffic, but I'll, I'll, let's just get started without him. I played his demo for this guy. I mean, is it crazy? Like he is off the chain crazy, um, you know, but I, I'd highly recommend those two books. Um, you know, and, and I, I'm, I could, I could list a, a whole host of other ones that have been impactful. Um, you know, another good one, I'm, I'm big into like learning from people who have done it to your point. Um, Ken langone has got a great one called I love capitalism. Um, it's a, it's basically, he founded Home Depot. Mm. It's his story. Um, super cool, super cool story. So, yeah. um, and shoe dog by Phil Knight, which I'm sure most people have read mm -hmm. by now amazing amazing story i mean those guys were almost bankrupt how many times you know you're having a bad day when your bank fires you and tells you not only we're we not going to bank with you anymore but we're calling the fbi on you <laughs> <laughs> and obviously we know nike is uh alive and kicking they're doing well so i, I love um, it i love yeah. it man yeah that's a classic uh, book. So final, final thing I want to wrap on is this, Michael, when a lot of people think about fitness, it's in the category of aspiration. When a lot of people think about spending time with their family, it's, it's a pleasant thought. What I have found is that there are certain habits or virtues that are a forcing function and a performance enabler for work. Could you just briefly riff on how you think about fitness and running in relation to what it enables you to do in work. I think that's yeah, absolutely awesome point. Um, I've definitely, so I was, I was an excuse guy before with fitness. <clears throat> um, you know, from, I used to be in great shape when I lived up in Ohio before I moved down here to Florida um, in 2011, I was at uh, that June, I was nine and a half percent body fat. Um, so yeah, it's, I was in great shape. I played sports. I, Anyway, I moved down here and I got busy. You know, I was, I was working 60 hours a week. Um, I still work 60 hours a week now, probably maybe even more. Um, but I found time. I actually am busier than I've ever been um, since that time, since I moved down here. I now have three kids under the age of five. So I have a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a six-month-old. Um, and last week I ran 26 miles or something. Um, you know, and the, the way I've done, like, I, I, Adam tried to get me to run with him, um, quite a bit for, for almost a year before I finally caught on. Um, it, it's made me a better person all around getting myself back into shape. I feel better. I have more energy. Um, you know, it, it, it makes me more excited to face the day when I know I've got that run coming at the end of the day. Mm. Um, so, so, and again, like if you're like, I hate running, I read a book called born to run. Um, and it talks about why you hate running. It talks about how, how this guy who also hated running and was like constantly injured because he was running, um, you know, how he got past that. Now he runs ultra marathons. He runs hundred mile races where before he couldn't get out the door and get off the couch. Um, I listened to a story and I was like, Oh, this is awesome. I can run further. I can run longer. Um, and he taught me some different things, um, you know, to allow for that. So you hit on family. Um, 
family is super important. I mean, my kids just bring me back to life. You know, you can spend a day at the office just getting the crap kicked out of you by owners, by tenants, nothing's going right. You get that lawsuit from somebody, uh, you know, it just stinks. You go home and as soon as they like, your daughter grafts on your leg or your son, you know, daddy, 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 and shoots you in the face with a gun or something. I mean, those, like, it, you just, it, the kids just bring you back to life. It becomes, all of it becomes worth it. Um, so I can't say enough about that. And, you know, my wife is obviously um, incredibly supportive. Um, she lets me do what I need to do to build our business and supports me in that. Um, she knows it's a long-term game. Um, and, you know, I couldn't ask for a, a better, uh, you know, partner in life for, for that. Um, Thank and you. then, that. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I took something good away from one of the speakers at your conference. He said it at Brooke or owner, but he said it again at your conference. When he comes, uh, kind of blanking on his name, the guy out of California. Uh, guy kind of, see, yeah. So yeah, uh, good call. He, um, he said he sits in his driveway every day when he gets home and spends a minute reflecting on how he wants to show up for his wife and kids. And that was one of the big things that I took away from broker owner is now I sit in my driveway for a minute and go in, before I go inside and I just get into that mindset of I'm dad. I'm no longer a mean property manager. I'm no longer, you know, boss. I'm no longer, you know, running a company. I need to go in and show up for the kids that are literally hiding underneath the kitchen table every single time as if I'm not going to find them under the kitchen table. Um, I think they got my brains. Uh, but yeah, so it, 